So how is social different from cultural? Are they different things? If they are, how are they different? And how about society? Is that different from social and from cultural? Well, that's what this video is all about. Okay, here we go. It's a daisy. Well, it would help if I put the bloody boot down, wouldn't it? Jeez. So culture's a system of social rules, you know? So right now I'm driving and I'm obeying the rules of the road. Highway code, we called it in the UK. So, you know, I, I drive on the left. I'm in Australia, so I drive on the left. I don't cross solid white lines. I stop at a stop sign. So I follow these rules, they're social rules. They're, you know, they're rules guiding my behavior when I'm driving. Is that culture? Do we describe those rules as culture? Do we say things like, in my culture, we drive on the left, or in my culture, we don't cross solid white lines on the road. We don't really talk like that. We could, people would kind of get what we mean, but it sounds a bit odd. Because really what we're talking about there is the society we live in and the, the road traffic regulations. You know, it's a system of social regulation. So we don't really talk about that as culture. That kind of gives you a clue, really, into the distinction between what's... So <laughs> I keep forgetting about that bump in the road. It gives us that sense of what's the difference between society and culture. Yeah, yeah, culture, we follow particular social rules, their various rituals, guide our behavior, common belief systems, and so on. And you can find all of those things in society as well. Yeah, society has social rules. But when we talk about society, we're more likely to talk about systems of regulation that are tied to particular social institutions. Like institutions like education, the banking system, system of law, welfare systems, housing systems, and so on. I'm going into the shops, and here you've got a mixture of cultural rules and societal rules. So I'm going to have to pay for my shopping. I don't really describe that as a cultural rule. Kind of just that's our system of finance and commerce, you know? It's pretty common. <laughs> it happens in a lot of places. You pay for stuff with money. So we more often think about that as the structuring of society rather than the structuring of culture. I suppose one way, really, of making that distinction is, in Australia, we, we all pay for stuff. We also all have to follow the regulations for road use. So it's something that happens across the whole population in a particular geographic location. It's what we mean by society. <laughs> Why can't I park? driving for years, 30 odd years, 35 years, still can't park. So yes, yeah, so I'm going into the shops and there'll be, you know, social regulation going on there, but there's also cultural rules in terms of how you interact with other people. You know, whether you start up a conversation with a complete stranger, whether you, when you're paying for your goods at, at the checkout, do you shake the person's hand? Do you give them a kiss on the cheek? How do you greet them? There are particular rules around that, you know? <laughs> if you, you go around pecking cashiers um, on the cheek to greet them every time you get to the checkout, mm. might cause some embarrassment, might maybe worse. So those are cultural rules. So there's, it's less about things tied to particular social institutions, you know, it, 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 
it's not really anything to do with that financial interaction that's regulated by the banks and finance uh, industry and so on. But it's a set of rules that guide your behaviour and you share particular expectations about what's appropriate, what, what's socially appropriate to do in particular situations. You can see how it's a kind of a little blurry between the two. And the, the biggest test, it's hard to pin down. It, it's kind of a lived experience, really. You kind of know when you're thinking about culture and when you're thinking about society by the way you express yourself. You know, whether you're referring to culture. So in my culture, we uh, drive on the left. That just sounds weird, doesn't it? But it is, you say, in my culture, a greeting for someone working at the checkout is usually just a, hello, how are you, how are you doing? You know, we don't shake hands. It's not that formal. So there are particular things that we would describe as cultural. We wouldn't really just say, in my society, you know, we don't shake hands with the cashiers. You just say it's, you know, a cultural thing, really. Okay, I better do my shopping. Let's go into all of this in a bit more detail. Let's start off with the word social. This is a key word because that is the word tagged to the biggest area of psychology we're tapping into, which is social psychology. It's what our textbook is all about. And social psychology encompasses cultural psychology and critical psychology. Now let me show you the connections here for using my animationary, animationary, I made up a new word there. <laughs> See what I did? Animation. <laughs> by showing you my little animation on this. So cultural and critical psychology are in many ways sub-disciplines to that broad discipline area of social psychology, though they are also often connected to that broader school of psychology called psychoanalysis. And some would say that when you start looking at cultural and critical psychology, you're actually looking at social psychology through the eyes of psychoanalysis. You know, the school of psychology that dominated psychology in the late 1800s, still about the 1920s. Still alive today, by the way. Alive and well in popular culture, but also in the advertising industry. But let's not worry about psychoanalysis just now. You can succeed on this unit without ever having to look at psychoanalysis. But for those of you who want to dig a bit deeper into this unit, then that's an area you could look at. But, but, but beware, you could end up descending down a rabbit hole and never coming out of it because it's a really complex and convoluted area of work. Okay, now, when we look at how cultural is defined, we start thinking about systems of social support. When we think about society and the social, we kind of think about systems of social power. I'll get to that in a minute and explain why there are these connections. And in a later episode, we'll have a look more deeply at those two key themes, social support and social power. So let's get back to those two key terms, social and cultural. So let's start off with the basics. What does the word social mean? Now, the word can be used as an eject adjective, adjective. You know, I'm social or I'm antisocial, which means I'm the sort of person who likes being around people or doesn't like being around people. Sometimes we use the word as a noun, like a social event, which means an event where people come together. You know, mingling. Mingling. <laughs> what, a, what a lovely word. Mingle, mingle. Be careful though, don't say, don't say a word too often, because it just loses its meaning. It goes all weird. So how about the word societal? This is an interesting word, because it captures a definition of social that sometimes we overlook. Social can mean small groups of people, but it can also mean a very large group of people, i.e. the whole of society. But to make it clear we're talking about a very large group, we often use the word societal. Now what's interesting is that we have social psychology rather than societal psychology. There is societal psychology, but mostly people know of social psychology. And this is why it's easy to get lost in social psychology because it encompasses both the understanding of micro level social interactions, you know, an interaction just between two people through to macro levels of social interaction, you know, the interactions that happen across a whole society. So that's why you can get a bit lost in this kind of area of the discipline. Now, so that we don't get lost, we're going to focus on the meaning of social as societal. And this is why we are bringing critical psychology into play here. Now, how about cultural? Well, that's also about groups of people, but maybe it's more about beliefs, customs, and so on. So let's first think 
of the way people greet each other in different cultures. You know, in some cultures, like the United States, UK, particularly the UK, also in Australia, people kind of shake hands when they meet someone, but that's changing. Um, in India, people join their hands. In Japan and China, people bow down from the waist. In Belgium, kissing on one cheek is a way to greet someone, irrespective of their gender. And in Europe, there are lots of different rules about how many cheeks and how many times you kiss a cheek in a greeting and which cheek to kiss. It's all very complicated, but they're cultural rules. So they're cultural rules rather than societal rules because they're specific to particular groups and in multicultural societies, you can have many such groups, you know, multiculturalism. That brings in a bit of confusion here because there are multiple cultural rules at play in a society. You know, have you ever been in those awkward encounters when you don't know whether to shake someone's hand or kiss them on the cheek or kiss them on two cheeks or hug or bow or whatever? You know, have you ever gone through that embarrassment when you get it wrong? Well, that's a sign that you've kind of sort of understood a cultural rule by breaking it. Or perhaps you haven't understood the cultural rule at all. It's just all too confusing. A society also has customs and rules. The example I gave is when I was driving, you know, their rules of using the road. Now it's clear we mean something different when we refer to culture compared to when we refer to society. But what's that difference? It's not an easy question to answer because the two concepts overlap in many ways and it's hard to separate them out. But don't be fooled into thinking that culture and society are the same thing. Think of how we talk about each. We talk about embracing a culture, but do we talk about embracing a society? We talk about multiculturalism, but do we talk about multi-societalism? I think that might be a new word again. And we, we talk about a breakdown in society, but do we also talk about a breakdown in culture? You know, we talk about the importance of passing culture on, but do we talk about passing society on. So there are differences, but they're subtle and they can be hard to pin down. But let's have a go. This is complicated and when we separate out society and culture, we may actually be trying to split apart something that's actually enmeshed together. This idea of things being pulled apart when actually they belong together is something we, we, we talk about a lot on this unit, you might have noticed. So with that in mind, let us work through what is generally understood to be the key differences between culture and society. So it's said that culture refers to the set of beliefs, practices, learned behaviour and moral values that are passed on from one generation to another. And society means an interdependent group of people who live together in a particular region and are associated to one another. Now here what we're doing is kind of making a distinction between practices which is culture, and people, which is society. But there's more to it than that because the society also practices, uh, have, has practices that people need to follow, like road rules. Also, culture is only ever expressed through people. You know, it's not an artifact that exists independently of people. A belief only exists when someone believes in it. Now, here's some more statements. Culture is something that guides our behaviour. Society is something that often prescribes our behaviour through setting out the structure by which we must organise our lives. Hey ho. Here's another one. Culture provides guidelines to how people live. Conversely, society is a structure that provides the way people organise themselves. And another one. Culture unites the social structure, whereas society constructs it, constructs the social structure. Okay, so, so here we're getting somewhere. You get that sense that culture is something about the thing that brings people together into structures that support each other, whereas society has structures that people need to fit into. You know, we're seeing a different type of dynamic here. You start to get a sense that culture is linked to systems of social support, and the sharing of knowledge. And society is linked more to the structure of social organizations and social systems. And by the latter, I mean mostly systems of authority that tell you what to do and when to do it. You know, systems that regulate our behavior, that get us to act in ways that we might not ordinarily act, but is the way that we need to act in order to be a part of society. Now, social structures are things like our educational system, our health care system, welfare system, systems of commerce and business and monetary systems like banks and so on. Now, culture 
might be less about that and more about the systems that support people coming together and forming groups with common purposes. Well, those distinctions kind of work. It's, it's sort of it sort of works. You know, this way of making the distinction works up to a point, but doesn't really capture the phenomena exactly. You know, there are always little gray areas and areas where you think actually culture has social institutions as well. We have cultural centers and so on. But we're gonna stick with these kind of ways of making the distinction because it helps us make enough sense of things to be able to bring into play cultural psychology, which is much more about systems of shared meanings, shared understandings and so on. And it also helps us to position critical psychology into the area that we're working and critical psychology is much more about the societal functioning particularly how social power operates through social institutions now here's another popular statement that resonates a bit with that way of thinking culture is reflected in the fashion lifestyle tastes and preferences music art etc as opposed to society which is reflected in an economy so it's kind of you're getting that distinction are you the kind of culture saying nice warm fluffy stuff society the the kind of hard edge stuff <laughs> you know commerce and business so it, it is hard to make these definitions so but we've got a bit of a definition there you know a way of contrasting culture and society and a way to bring cultural critical and social psychology into a space where we can make sense of how they interrelate. But I do want you to remember that this is a heuristic, it's not reality. And what I mean is that by heuristic, it's an analysis that doesn't reflect reality, but provides us with useful tools to rethink that reality. Psychology, it has been said, and I would say, uses lots of these heuristic techniques so a heuristic technique, let's give you a formal definition of it. A heuristic technique, often called simply a heuristic, is any approach to problem solving, learning or discovery that employs a practical method, not guaranteed to be optimal or perfect, but sufficient for the immediate goals. Okay, so it's just a device. It's not supposed to uh, be an accurate reflection of reality, but it's a useful device to help us think about reality in a different way. The problem is that sometimes these tools be can become so overused that, that they get to the point that people forget they're just these imperfect tools that help us obtain our immediate goals. They're not descriptions of reality. You know, they, they always need that little piece of elastic attached to them, you know, to snap them back into the toolbox the moment we stop using them. You know, like, like having a pair of binoculars. They take them out of the to toolbox, binocular case and we have a particular view of things when we're looking through them and when we put the binoculars down they snap back into the binocular case so that we can see reality as we ordinarily would i think that kind of works as an example anyway sometimes the elastic snaps through overuse and then we're stuck with the tool we're stuck looking at the world through these pair of binoculars and we start seeing reality in a different way which isn't actually the way we ordinarily would see reality now perhaps the concept of mental illness which we're going to get to in a couple of weeks time is like that you know it's a heuristic that's been mistaken for reality the heuristic being we think of people's psychological problems as a form of illness but we've forgotten that that was only a heuristic to make help us engage in a useful way with people who are experiencing psychological disorders now the problem is that we now think that's reality we now think people are actually ill now people are arguing that heuristic, that tool is not useful anymore. It's not doing anyone any good. People aren't generally doing well under that approach, but we've forgotten. It's a tool that we should put away and try something else. Now, why is it important to think about cultural issues in psychology? Well, because psychology seeks to understand human behavior. And to do that, we need to understand the difference between a universal pattern of social behavior and what is a more confined, specific pattern of social behavior. Now, typically, when one culture becomes dominant, it assumes its rules and rituals and languages uh, and ways of understanding the world are universal. That's the criticism made against psychology, that it's not fully understood how the behaviors it thinks are universal Universal are actually often culturally specific. Why is it important to think about societal issues in psychology? Well, because like culture, the social context in which people live and the structures people live in impacts people's behaviors and experiences. 
And we can't understand human behavior by understanding those social structures. And because people are subject to social systems of authority, that they behave in particular ways because they're under a system of authority that compels them or persuades them to act in those particular ways. It's not human nature, but it's a reflection of the social structures within which they live. And we need to understand those structures and understand how social power impacts on people's behaviors and experiences. But also we need to understand that psychology functions in society as a social institution that also imposes its own systems of authority over people's lives. You know, it nudges people to behave in a particular way, typically through the therapeutic encounter where we deliberately try to change people's behavior. So we are one of those social institutions that exert social power in order to get people to behave in a different way. So when we ask why someone behaves in the way they do, we need to be dissatisfied by any answer that only cites a kind of biological explanation or maybe an evolutionary explanation tied to biology, like saying it's something in our genes. We need to be dissatisfied with that sort of explanation because we also need to include a social and cultural explanation to understand the social context in which people's lives are lived. Give an example close to my heart, why do people drink coffee? First answer could be because they're addicted to caffeine. That would be a kind of biological answer. Another answer would be because it's fashionable to drink coffee and it serves as an icebreaker when meeting someone in a social setting. That would be a kind of cultural answer. Another answer would be because marketing companies have manipulated us to think that we need to drink coffee. Coffee actually tastes pretty disgusting, but we are persuaded to drink it by effective marketing, and now we kind of think coffee tastes pretty good. Now, why why do I drink coffee? Well, mind your own business. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what to do, like psychologists trying to get into me, Ed. Okay, okay, that's enough for now. But till next time, ta-da. <laughs>